This week on the Green Left News podcast, the people's blockade of the world's largest coal port, students' strike for Palestine, and the fight for abortion rights in the US. This podcast was recorded on stolen land. Green Left is committed to supporting struggles for First Nations justice. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Isaac Nellis, and today I'm joined by Green Left contributor Anissa Vamji. Welcome. Hi, Isaac. Awesome to be here. Let's kick it off. Yeah, let's kick it off this week with one of the most exciting protests that I've attended in a while, and that's the People's Blockade of the World's Biggest Coal Port in Mullabimba on Newcastle. This was a four-day event that was organized by Rising Tide, uh, which is a climate action group, and they managed to encourage more than 3,000 people to come down to Horseshoe Beach for a huge effort to blockade the port for more than 30 hours from November 24 to 27. The scale was super impressive with hundreds of people uh, hitting the water in kayaks and small watercrafts to prevent any coal ships from leaving the port. And on the beach, there was an incredible atmosphere. It's dubbed a protestival because of the live music and general party atmosphere. There's also, you know, heaps of other activities going on throughout the four-day blockade, including a dog parade, a huge human sign, and a lot of fun to be had on the water, including slides and other uh, uh, fun activities. But all that stuff didn't distract from the core of the weekend, which was the fight for real action on climate. Uh, Another highlight was a um, Socialist Alliance-initiated Palestine Solidarity Action, um, particularly because there was Palestine rallies on at the same weekend. Um, But after the kind of approved 30 hours of the blockade had ended, about 100 activists decided to continue and defy the police. They stayed out for another two hours or so before police boats came and arrested 109 people uh, with an age range of 15 to 97. So 97-year-old Alan Stewart is actually the oldest person to ever be arrested for protesting in Australia. And Rising Tide organiser Sean Murray said that the scale of the arrests was unprecedented. The blockade represents a real revitalisation of the climate movement and plans to scale up the blockade to be even bigger next year should be welcomed. You can check out the Green Left Facebook page or uh, other social media for some incredible photos of the weekend, including summaries of each day's activities. And check greenleft.org.au for some video interviews we conducted, including this one with former Green Senator Lee Rhiannon. It's a, an occasion I really love because you're doing the right thing. You're taking up the critical issue of climate change and also it's good fun. You know, like being out on the water with all those um, structures, and I have to call them structures, put together with barrels and, and um, sort of pipes and, and there's even a slippery dip on one of the big ones. So it's just spectacular than all the kayaks. And we're actually blocking the world's biggest port, stopping the coal, going out on container ships. What if the other highlight? Lights was a forum that Green Left and Rising Tide co-hosted on the opening night that discussed workers' solidarity with the climate movement and a just transition for workers in polluting industries. Green Left radio host Zane Alcorn, who is also an activist with Rising Tide and Socialist Alliance, chaired the discussion, which heard from speakers who discussed life after coal and challenged the notion that it's jobs versus the environment. Tim Lang from Labor Environment Action Network discussed the urgent need to build a renewables industry and to train coal and gas workers to work in it. Lee May Brucey, representing Friends of the Earth and Co-Power, discussed alternative energy systems such as cooperatives. Wadi Wadi man Matt Jeffrey, a lands rights activist and committed unionist, drew upon lessons learned in the Pilliger anti-fracking campaign and stressed the need to build an alliance of community organisations and trade unions to confront the power of fossil fuel corporations. Maddie Yerbury from the Tomorrow Movement talked about the climate jobs guarantee and said the housing and cost of living crises needed public investment. Final speaker was former coal worker Grant Howard. Howard has 40 years experience in the coal industry and said when he began his career at 17, he did not expect to end it blockading a coal port. He emphasised the importance of providing alternative jobs for coal workers. You can watch the full live stream video of the forum at Greenleft's YouTube channel. Yeah, that was a really uh, interesting forum. And a few days before the blockade, uh, Green Left co-hosted another forum with Socialist Alliance, which discussed how to protect our protest rights, which I actually had the pleasure of chairing. So that was a lot of fun. 
where you had uh, Sydney criminal lawyers, journalist Paul Gregoire explaining how the former coalition government and the current Labor government are enforcing these extreme anti-protest laws with aggressive bail conditions that are designed to suppress the climate movement and other protest movements as well. And Emma Dorge from Blockade Australia, who's been the target herself of harsh anti-protest repression, said that we need to normalise protests that push the boundaries of state authority. She also explored the history of anti-protest laws in Australia. And Lydia Shelley, who's the president of the New South Wales Council for Civil Liberties, said governments are trying to conflate protests with criminal conduct and said the CCL would vigorously defend the right to protest. And Zane Alcorn, who you just mentioned, uh, one of the co-hosts of Green Left Radio on 3CR, uh, said it was critical to get the unions involved in the climate movement to build a mass movement that's strong enough to confront the power of the state. And in, in the discussion section, there was uh, great contributions about tactics and strategy, including comparing the climate movement to the massive movement for Palestine that is happening at the moment. In other climate news, the following weekend after rising tide, there was a protest in Gadi, Sydney on December 2nd to coincide with the COP28 summit in Dubai. The COP summits are supposed to be about governments coming together to do something about the climate crisis, but have become a farce, with fossil fuel companies and governments greenwashing and refusing to make any meaningful changes. Protesters held a sit-in in the middle of the city and were flanked by hundreds of police officers. When I say climate, you say justice. Climate, justice. Climate, justice. When I say no more, you say no more coal. No more coal. No more coal. The protest called for 100% renewables by 2030, a just transition for fossil fuel workers and First Nations-led solutions and real carbon cuts, not offsets. And we'll talk a little bit more about the COP28 uh, the actual conference uh, in the international section. Uh, but meanwhile, uh, climate activist Justin Tuddy has appeared before the Darwin local court on November 28. He was charged with trespass for locking on to Tamboran Resources' mega fracker in May. And the US company uh, Tamboran acquired Origin Energy stake in the Beetaloo Basin fracking last year. And they want to drill 12 pilot wells on a Munji Munji cattle station. Uh, At full production, the Northern Territory and federal governments envisage 200 to 300 wells a year over 20 to 40 years. But uh, fortunately, these plans are being scrutinised by the NT Supreme Court in a case that was brought by the Central Australia Frack Free Alliance against the NT Environment Minister. Tamboran workers went public in August about being told to spray contaminated drill rig water across the site. And Climate Analytics estimates that the annual emissions from fracking the Beetaloo Basin would be equivalent to 11% of Australia's total emissions. So we already know that to stop climate disaster, no new fossil fuel projects can be approved. And we need more actions like the rising tide blockade and the COP28 protests to stop governments and the fossil fuel industry from destroying our planet. Students left their classrooms to school strike for Palestine in Gadi and Nam, Melbourne on November 23rd and 24th. The Nam rally was joined by more than 3,000 students and teachers, even after the Victorian government told people not to attend. Students are clearly seeing the genocide in Gaza on social media and understand that what is happening is wrong and needs to be protested against. Greenleft spoke to some students at the Gadi rally about why they attended the school strike. So why did you decide to skip school and come to the Palestine school strike today? I decided today? to skip school to show my support to Free Palestine, to encourage all young people, especially high schoolers, to come just for one day. It's okay to miss school. It's okay for you to come, show yourself, to say that we need to show this support for especially high schoolers. Um, we're here to stop the genocide and support our people in Palestine. It's not just students that are seeing through the censorship and lies about what's happening in Gaza. Journalists in the mainstream media are pushing back at management censorship of their coverage of Israel's attack. A letter was signed by journalists and released on November 24, which outlined concerns that media companies were imposing a Zionist lens over their reporting, which threatens truth and full context. 
but management has refused to listen to the concerns of journalists and have instead banned those who signed the letter from reporting on the genocide. It's no coincidence that many editors have been on Israeli government-sponsored trips to Israel, but this attempt to silence journalists reporting on the situation in Gaza will not succeed because the war is being virtually live-streamed onto social media feeds. Horrifying images of death and destruction in Gaza make the Zionist lies clear to see, and combined with the huge weekly protests in major cities across the country, it means that the media bosses are not going to be able to get away with the same kind of propaganda they used 20 years ago to support the Western war on Afghanistan and Iraq after the 9-11 attacks. Local councils are another arena where solidarity with Palestinian people and condemning the genocide in Gaza have become key topics. So far, three Victorian councils have supported motions condemning Israel's war crimes and calling for a permanent ceasefire. These are Marybeck, Maribyrnong and Dandenong. Yarra Council has foreshadowed a discussion on December 12th. Meanwhile, as we discussed on previous episodes, Geelong Council's CEO did not allow Socialist Alliance Councillor Sarah Hathaway to even table a ceasefire motion for discussion, despite strong community support for the motion. There are also attempts to rescind the Maribyrnong Council motion, which will be debated on December 12th. Other councils that have passed motions include Canterbury, Bankstown and Bayside Councils in New South Wales and Hobart Council in Tasmania. On Monday, December 11th, activists are rallying outside Sydney Town Hall at 4pm and then attending the City of Sydney's council meeting, calling on councillors to pass a ceasefire motion. If you're in the area, please come and show your support. Yeah, and Construction, Forestry, Maritime, Mining and Energy Union, or CFMEU, National Secretary Christy Kane called on the Australian Council of Trade Unions to organise trade unions for a permanent ceasefire and an end to the blockade on Gaza. In an address to the December 3 Palestine march in Nam, he said that peace has always been union business and urged Prime Minister Anthony Albanese to get off his knees and support the people of Palestine. And you can watch the full speech at greenleft.org.au. I want to call out some people because I don't believe the union movement has done enough. I want to call out the leaders of the ACTU, which I'm an executive of. I want to tell them this, that we want you to organise, organise and organise again a union rally. One that brings them together. One that brings them together. While the ACTU and other unions have called for a ceasefire, most of the organising of union members in the Palestine movement has been done by rank-and-file members. Another example of this is the New South Wales United Services Union, which condemned the rising conflict and suffering taking place in the Middle East, but did not call for a ceasefire or any meaningful action. It also sent a text message criticising USU members who signed a Palestine Solidarity Petition. Rank-and-file USU members have now published an open letter calling on USU leadership to take a stronger position in support of Palestine, including supporting the trade unionists for Palestine statement, condemning Albanese and New South Wales Premier Chris Minns, support for Israel, supporting boycott, divestment and sanctions, and encouraging members to attend Palestine Solidarity marches. You can find out more by visiting USU members Stand with Palestine on social media. And residents across Western Sydney continue to express their solidarity with Palestine, organising vigils and discussion forums to outline support for a permanent ceasefire and an end to Israel's occupation. And protests were also held outside Federal MP Michelle Rowland's office in Blacktown, continuing the protests that have been going on outside Labor offices across the country since the start of Israel's bombing campaign. And Palestine solidarity is also spread to the Blue Mountains, where a newly formed Blue Mountains Friend of Palestine group uh, organising rallies in Katoomba. Activists blockaded the US Embassy in Nam on November 27th to protest the US and Australian government's role in supporting Israel's war on Gaza. They locked themselves onto a fence and chanted, we will free Palestine within our lifetime, before Victorian police arrested them. Another activist used a lock-on device to blockade tram lines along St Kilda Road during peak hour. Meanwhile, a community-led blockade of Pine Gap, the joint US-Australian Defence Intelligence Facility near Alice Springs, was blockaded. As we've previously discussed, Pine Gap provides surveillance data to aid Israel in its carpet bombing of Gaza. 
These actions show that there can be no business as usual while Israel ethnically cleanses Palestinians. Yeah, it's great to hear about all the blockades going on across the country. There was also incredible success in Western Australia as a community picket blocked the Israeli-owned Zim shipping line for 24 hours on December 2, costing the company roughly $250,000. The blockade was successful because the overwhelming majority of the workforce turned around and went home instead of trying to cross the picket. And this follows on from the blockades of Zim ships in Nam and Gadi over the past few weeks, including the Gadi protest uh, where New South Wales police charged the crowd with horses and arrested about 20 people. You can check out Greenleft's interview with uh, Sam Wainwright, who was involved in organising the Fremantle picket on our website. So our calculation was essentially that if... uh, if we could prevent or convince the workers not to not to go to work, um, then uh, you know no, no work could happen for the subsequent eight hours. So essentially, there were community pickets for those critical windows uh, around um, two thirty to three thirty in the afternoon and ten thirty to around eleven thirty in the evening. Uh, and the really positive news is that um, all but a handful of workers did, did not go to work. Of course, we would be remiss not to mention that the huge rallies for Palestine in major cities have continued, with the first weekend of December marking the eighth straight week of demonstrations in some cities. Activists have pledged to continue protesting over the holiday period and into the new year. While numbers dipped slightly during the temporary pause when Israel stopped its bombing for roughly a week to facilitate a hostage exchange, protesters came out in numbers again when the bombing restarted. This movement has become one of the biggest anti-war movements in recent history and there are so many actions, big and small, going on all around. We've tried to give a picture of the inspiring actions people are taking on this podcast and at Green Left. And let's hope the movement continues to grow so we can end Australia's support for Israel, end the occupation of Palestine and win a free Palestine together. West Papuans and supporters raised the Morning Star flag, which is the flag of West Papua, at Leichhardt Town Hall in Gadi on December 1, marking the 62nd anniversary of the first time the flag was raised. West Papua is still under brutal occupation by Indonesia, and we spoke to some attendees of the flag raising about what this day means for them. As we know that Indonesia is uh, one of the, the biggest uh, military power country. And we see every time the West Papua's population, West Papua's civilian movement and political movement, they go to the, this protest. They can't. That's, uh, they only meet with the Indonesian forces. And there is no democracy at all. The significance of this day. Today is uh, December 1st. In 1961, we recognize our independent day as a West Papua. And then we, that's why we continue until we're celebrating. Every year we will be celebrating until that year come we get in our independence. An international forum on workplace health and safety on November 27th heard from unionists about the struggle to protect workers. Liam O'Brien, Assistant Secretary of the Australian Council of Trade Unions, told the forum Australia has some shocking and inexcusable statistics on workplace safety. He said around 200 people die per year from workplace incidents and pointed to the campaign to stop the use of materials that expose workers to silicosis. Around 600,000 workers are exposed to the condition and 100,000 will be diagnosed with silicosis at some stage. Unionists from Zimbabwe, United Kingdom and representatives from the Asia-based Centre for Public Health and Environmental Development, the International Labour Organisation and the International Trade Union Confederation spoke about the urgent need to make workplaces safer and for international collaboration on this issue. And police have dropped charges against eight refugee supporters who participated in a car cavalcade in 2020. The eight people were among 30 who joined the car convoy past the Mantra Hotel in Preston in Nam, which was being used as a prison for refugees brought to Australia for medical treatment after being detained for years on Manus Island or Nauru. The refugees were also at high risk of catching COVID-19 in the hotel prison, 
in the midst of the lockdowns, Victorians were only allowed to leave their home for four reasons. And one of these was to show care and compassion for those in need, which activists argued that the car convoy was doing exactly that. The prosecution dropped the case uh, after a court date on November 22, which is a win for the refugee rights movement and the right to protest. On November 18th, a speakout was held in Nam calling on Labour to bring refugees held in offshore detention to safety. The speakout was organised by the Refugee Action Collective and heard from speakers who explained the dire situation many refugees are facing. About 14,000 refugees and asylum seekers remain in Indonesia after Coalition Immigration Minister Scott Morrison decided in 2014 that even people recognised as refugees by the United Nations High Commission for Refugees would never be allowed to come to Australia. About 60 refugees have died since 2014, 18 by suicide. Yeah, and uh, Australia's horrific treatment of refugees comes from the same ideology that led to a group of about 35 masked men wearing black and marching through the centre of Ballarat on December 3, which is the anniversary of the Eureka blockade. And they were carrying a banner that said, Australia for the white man. So Ballarat Regional Trades and Labor Council has spoken out against these fascists and has organised a peaceful, inclusive dawn service, saying it would never allow the far right to co-opt the symbols of Eureka which stand for justice, democracy, liberty and freedom for all. The Ballarat Regional Trades and Labor Council said the working people of Ballarat will never welcome fascists. A progressive ticket has been formed to contest the Cairns Regional Council elections in March next year. Community First includes members of Socialist Alliance, the Greens and Independents and is being supported by some left Labor members. Candidate Renee Lees told Green Left that the council is very business and developer heavy. She said they have increasingly taken council down an anti-democratic path, including by limiting councillors' ability to put motions. They have also been accused of repeated conflicts of interest. Community First has a list of key policies including affordable housing, better public transport and climate action. It is supporting restorative justice solutions to youth crime as opposed to a controversial new youth detention centre. If you are in the Cairns area, get involved in the campaign by attending the the December 12th forum on how the council can tackle the housing crisis and find out more at the link in the description. And New South Wales Greens MLC Amanda Cohn presented a bill on November 22, which would provide a pathway for councils to undo the forced amalgamations of 2016. It seeks to give voice to communities across New South Wales who say the forced amalgamations have not worked. The Local Government Amendment De-Amalgamation Plebiscites Bill aims to remove roadblocks on councils. Specifically, it would enable the de-amalgamation of Kudamundra Gundagai Shire Council, as recommended by the New South Wales Boundary Commission and approved by the previous Minister for Local Government. And the bill sets out a plebiscite process for communities to have a direct say in whether to de-amalgamate If 10% of the community want to vote, a plebiscite will be held. And then if a majority vote yes to amalgamate, the minister must follow through. Residents of the 44 high-rise public housing flats set to be demolished by the Victorian government crammed into a room at the Flemington estate on November 25th to discuss how to fight the plan. Many reported on the pressure being exerted onto them by Homes Victoria officials to shift to community housing, where tenants pay higher rent and have less rights. There was a unanimous agreement to call on the government to immediately stop the destruction and privatisation of public housing, maintain existing public housing and build new public housing on public land. Yeah, Marybeck councillors are also joining the campaign to stop the demolitions. With Socialist Alliance, Marybeck councillor Sue Bolton telling Green Left that local councils should back the campaign and oppose the demolition of the estates and oppose the forced relocation of tenants. She told Green Left that the government claims the flats are past their use-by date, but has refused to provide any evidence. It's presenting its plan as a done deal, and she said demolition will exacerbate the housing crisis because those tenants will need new places and the public housing waiting list will grow even longer. Independent councillors at Marybeck, James Conlon and Monica Hart, are also pushing the council to oppose the demolitions, passing a motion at the November 8 council meeting. And another motion opposed the privatisation of public land through the ground lease model, 
where the government leases the land to a private developer for 30 years. Conlon described this as privatisation by stealth. Housing activists across the country are taking part in a National Day of Action for Housing as a Human Right on December 9th. Public housing tenants, renters, homeless people, unionists and community organisers are taking action across the country to demand real action for housing justice. The housing crisis is the worst in living memory, organisers said. It is a humanitarian disaster. At least 750,000 people live in housing stress and are in desperate need of secure housing. And we'll talk more about those uh, important actions for housing justice on next week's episode. So now let's hear what's happening around the world. The fight to win and protect abortion rights in the United States has continued since Roe v. Wade was overturned in June last year by the reactionary Supreme Court. Immediately after the decision, abortion groups mobilized to protect the right to abortion in Kansas, Vermont, California, Michigan, Montana and Kentucky. Some of these fights were to affirm the right to abortion, while others were about defeating referendums that would outlaw abortion or make it more difficult to access. Recently, the momentum for abortion rights has continued in Ohio, with a citizen-initiated referendum held in the Republican-controlled state on November 7th. The referendum won, overturning a ban on abortion after six weeks and codifying abortion rights in the state's constitution. Republicans had even changed the rules to make a referendum win require 60% vote instead of a majority, but they were defeated. Following that victory, groups are mobilizing in Arizona, Nevada, Pennsylvania and Florida, and abortion rights are sure to be a key issue in the 2024 elections. But campaigners know that building a mass movement for abortion rights will be more effective than relying on the Democrats. Also in the US, Islamophobia is on the rise in the wake of Israel's genocidal war on Gaza, which has so far resulted in the deaths of more than 16,000 Palestinians. Three 20-year-old Palestinian students, Hisham, Awatani, Kinan Abdelhamid and Tarsin Ahmed, were shot in broad daylight on November 25 in Vermont. And this follows the stabbing murder of a Palestinian-American six-year-old in Chicago last month. Although the killings of the three students were clearly hate crimes, they were speaking a mix of Arabic and English and wearing kafirs when they were shot, the police said they were investigating the shooter's motivation. The alleged shooter is a 48-year-old white man who has pled not guilty, and all three students were graduates of the Ramallah Friends School in the Israeli-occupied West Bank and were studying at Brown University, Haverford College and Trinity College. The American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee released a statement saying there is reason to believe that this shooting occurred because the victims are Arab. A coalition of Ivy League students for Palestine have called on students from major universities to wear their kafirs and Palestinian flag colours in solidarity, and they said, in the face of hatred, we will not stand down. Rallies and vigils have been held for the victims, but this rise in Islamophobia reflects President Joe Biden and the US establishment's full-throated support for Israel's genocidal war. Yeah, and another element that reflects the US's support for Israel is the strong white Christian support for Zionism. At a large pro-Israel march in Washington, D.C. on November 14th was a big contingent of evangelical white Christian nationalists. These groups have a history of racial violence against black people and other people of colour who they believe are secretly financed by Jews and believe that Jews should leave the United States and go to Israel to fulfil a biblical prophecy. This protest was attended by Senate Democrat leader Chuck Schumer, who reiterated the Democrats' support for Israel's war, and was also attended by Republican House Speaker Mike Johnson and Christian Zionist pastor John Hagee, who previously made the horrible statement that God sent Hitler to help Jews reach the Promised Land. At the rally, Hagee said that the war was a fight between civilization and barbarism, Christian Zionists combine anti-Semitism with Zionism by encouraging Jews to leave the US and go to Israel. There is a history of Zionist collaboration with anti-Semitic groups. 
Theodore Herzl, who was recognised as the founder of modern Zionism, believed the solution to anti-Semitism was for Jews to form their own nation. But Zionism could only achieve these goals by relying on Western imperialism. This highlights the importance of the anti-colonial struggle by Palestinians against Israel and of anti-Zionist Jews speaking out against Israel's genocide. Meanwhile, in Canada, police have escalated their surveillance, intimidation and criminalisation of Palestine solidarity activists that we've reported on in previous episodes. They have raided activists' homes and are treating expressions of solidarity with Palestinians as hate crimes. On November 22, they raided the homes of activists and made 10 arrests in relation to a Palestine solidarity action at a bookstore. And police broke down doors and seized mobile phones and laptops. They handcuffed and traumatized children and elderly family members. The bookstore was Indigo Books, was an Indigo Books chain, which is Canada's largest bookstore chain, uh, with activists pouring red paint symbolizing blood on the windows and sidewalk and pasting up posters of the company's CEO alongside the words funding genocide. Indigo Books has long been the target of boycotts with CEO Heather Reisman and her husband Jerry Schwartz running the HESEG Foundation or H-E-S-E-G, which provides support to Israeli Defense Force soldiers. And police have amplified and taken advantage of hate crime accusations to expand their resources and target activists. And these raids represent a disturbing increase of police state repression of dissent. COP28, the major global gathering of governments to reach agreement on tackling the climate crisis, was hosted by a petroleum state that is silencing voices of dissent. On November 21st, only nine days before the start of COP28 in Dubai, United Arab Emirates, 350.org's Bill McKibben shared an alarming graph showing that, for the first time, global surface temperatures temporarily rose by two degrees Celsius compared to pre-industrial levels. Despite these harrowing revelations, climate journalists have since revealed that the UAE planned to use COP28 to sign oil deals, a cynical act that exposes the flagrant hypocrisy of the capitalist class's attitude to global warming. Capitalist governments are far from the drastic reductions in greenhouse gas emissions and carbon drawdown necessary to prevent this temporary temperature rise from becoming the norm setting us well on the path to an unlivable planet for the majority of the world's human and non-human population. On the contrary, emissions have steadily increased during the past few years. The environmental destruction caused by wars, occupations and the military-industrial complex are compounding the crisis. Notably, Indigenous peoples continue to face land theft and dispossession as fossil fuels and mining companies embark on violent land grabs. As Greta Thunberg said in the Netherlands recently, there is no climate justice on occupied land, and we wholeheartedly concur. And there's some bad news has come out from the Netherlands as the far right uh, make major gains in the recent Dutch elections, winning 37 out of 150 parliamentary seats. Gert Welder's Freedom Party, or PVV, is now well ahead of the joint Social Democratic and Greens ticket that won 25 seats. And while the number of seats for left-wing parties remained constant, parties that were part of the centre-right government all lost seats. So the right has been recomposed and radicalised while the left was unable to advance from its previous weak position. Back in July, the People's Party for Freedom and Democracy, uh, or VVD, uh, Prime Minister Mark Rutte, triggered a collapse of government and early elections by insisting on new restrictions on refugee rights, which crossed a line with one of the VVD's coalition parties. The government had hoped that by moving further to the right on this issue, it could regain some of the support it was losing to the far right. But this gamble proved to be a failure and actually boosted the PVV. Wilder's party wants to completely close the borders for refugees, wants to ban Islamic schools and the Quran and mosques, and also wants to deploy the army to deport criminals who have a dual nationality. So in the coming period, the Dutch left will be on the defensive, countering these anti-migrant policies and fighting racism will be the priority campaigns. But there is still some hope in the large demonstrations for climate action and for Palestine solidarity that have occurred in the recent weeks. Panama's Supreme Court has ruled that the contract signed between the state and Minera Panama to operate the Cobre Panama mine is unconstitutional, 
following weeks of mass sustained protests demanding its closure. This decision follows mass environmental uprising in Panama after mining company Minera Panama received a new contract to continue operations at its huge open pit copper and gold mine in the ecologically sensitive Mesoamerican Biological Corridor for another 20 years. Monero Panama, a subsidiary of transnational First Quantum Minerals, or FQM, had been exploiting the mine for the past 20 years with little regard to the corridor's ecological welfare and did so without paying taxes between 2017 and 2023. According to FQM's financial reports, the Cobre Panama mine accounted for 48% of FQM's global profits. The issue came to a head in August when governments presented the new contract to the Assembly of Deputies. Trade unions, lawyers and environmentalists responded by saying that the contract was unconstitutional and that the Supreme Court should declare the government in contempt. Instead, Congress approved the contract on October 21st after only three days of discussion. This provoked social uproar in a country already fed up with the lack of social security, corruption and an extremely high cost of living. The movement, led mainly by the Teachers' Union, or ASOPROF, and the Construction Workers' Union, S-U-N-T-R-A-C-S, involved large marches, road blockades, and social media mobilization. It is important to note that First Nations people played an integral role in these protests, particularly the Ngabe, who throughout blockaded the Inter-American Highway heading towards Costa Rica, successfully shutting down one of Panama's most important highways. And you can read more about all of these stories that we've talked about today, as well as watching videos, detailed analysis, and book and music reviews at greenleft.org.au. As always, you can head to our activist calendar at greenleft.org.au slash events to find out about upcoming protests, rallies, forums, and cultural events that are happening in your town and city. And if you're organizing the event, you can easily add it to the calendar by clicking on the add event feature. One of the important events we've got coming up on uh, December 12th at 6 p.m. in Gadi and also on Zoom is a forum on building the movement to free Palestine. So it's going to be some great speakers, including Vivian Porschalt from Jews Against the Occupation, Khaled Ghanem, who's a Palestinian with Al Entalaka Research Center and Socialist Alliance, uh, Rehab Charida, who's a Palestinian media artist from Saf Saf Village, and Ahmed Abadla, who's a Palestinian Australian from Gaza, who's involved in the Palestine Solidarity Movement. So that's going to be a really great forum. So check out more information on the Green Left Events page or on Facebook. And hopefully we'll see you there. If you've enjoyed this podcast, you can become a Green Left supporter today from $5 a month and donate to our 2023 Fighting Fund to help us continue reporting on workers, climate and social justice movements. Go to greenleft.org.au forward slash support to help us out. As always, your support is greatly appreciated. And thanks to Sean Valenzuela for the music and editing of this podcast. You can find his work by going to at Little Archer Beats on social media or clicking the link in the description. And remember to follow at Green Left Online on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Threads and TikTok for the latest news and analysis. Thanks for listening. Thank you.